okay, what can we do to break up the cult here, the cult in the U.S. and maybe cults elsewhere? Uh, here on American Issues, take two here on a given Thursday, and we have uh, my co-host, Tim Apicella. Uh, we have our contributors, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and we have our special esteemed guest, Emeritus uh, Political Science Professor U.H. Manfred Henningsen. Thank you all for being here. So let me begin with you, Tim. Uh, let's let's get our nomenclature right. What's a cult? Well, uh, good morning, Jay. Uh, cult basically is excessive devotion to a person or an object or a belief system. And uh, it could take forms of many ways uh, in this country and around the world. Um, I'm thinking of the cult of Joseph McCarthy during the Red Scare. Uh, he had a cult-like status and caused the careers and in some cases the lives of Americans because they're being labeled as communists. Uh, I'm thinking also is of course, Jim Jones in the People's Temple down in Guyana. David Koresh was a cult leader. Uh, remember Marshall Applewhite. Uh, he was the UFO uh, hail bop comet uh, cult that uh, led to the suicide of many uh, young, young men. Um, and to what degree does Donald Trump fit into a cult-like figure? Well, it's public idolization of, of, a, of a person. It's the, it's the worship, if you will, of, of an individual and, and sacrificing or putting aside the rational thought process, the, the rational thinking process, and just going to whatever the individual says is right or what they want uh, you to do for them. And I think Donald Trump qualifies as a cult status personality. Um, you, have have also... a certain, you have to have a certain skill to do this. I mean, can I wake up in the morning, Tim, Manfred, Stephanie, can I wake up in the morning one morning and say, I think I want to be a cult figure? And I read all the books, study it. You know, I, I learn how to speak those special words. Um, you know, Hitler was a master of public speaking uh, and um, and become a cult figure. Can I do it or, no. or is it reserved for certain personality types, certain a certain genius, if you will? Well, I wouldn't call it genius. I think they are suffering all from megalomania. And it's I mean, you, you have to be megalomaniacal in order to become this type of leader uh, figure and i you know uh, have here the the uh, portrait the, the uh, analysis of the personality of Adolf hitler that the oss did in 1943 that the author was henry murray harvard psychological clinic and uh, it is quite extraordinary when you read parts of it let me give you only one thing that i think applies to what you just uh, asked in that text, it says, uh, he experiences, he talks about Hitler here. He experiences periods of marked abstraction, violent emotional outbursts, visions of hallucinatory clarity. In speaking before crowds, he's virtually possessed. He clearly belongs to the sensational company of history making hysterics, combining as he does some of the attributes of the primitive shaman, the religious visionary, and the crack brained demagogue, consummate actor, one and all. I don't think you're any of that. Uh, <laughs> well, you don't know me well enough, man. For wait a minute. I think you forgot one thing, and that's charismatic. And of course, yes, no, that's. Okay, you qualify. <laughs> no, no, that is, uh, there is, uh, there is, in Hitler, the trend is so intense and the, uh, the uh, extremely balancing forces, affection, conscience, self. Uh, criticism, humor, are so weak that we are justified in speaking uh, in speaking of megalomania. Uh, uh, Can you tell us what what is megalomania, Manfred? Well, it's this uh, superiority complex. You know, these people believe that they are uh, superior to anybody else, uh, even if it's quite obvious that they are not. But they believe in it. And strangely enough, you know, people follow that. I mean, you have that in a way as a dimension of uh, the MAGA cult, you know, in the United States as well. I mean, you have other f political figures at this time. You know, P Putin is uh, the best and sickening, the most sickening illustration uh, at this uh, point. But you have Erdogan in Turkey. You have Xi Jinping. You know, you have you had Duterte. 
in uh, the in the Philippines. So there is no lack of figures who qualify for this position of being a megalomaniacal cult leader. Now, why well, people follow- one of the elements that I that I that I find as a common denominator is that a cult figure can make people do things, you know, in large numbers, make people do things that are completely irrational uh, against their own interests. In fact, in in many of the cases, Tim listed suicidal. Um, And that that is quite remarkable. You know, that seems to that seems to be against human nature. It seems to be against the, you know, the primary need to survive. And my question to you, Manfred, is it goes beyond political science. It goes to human psychology, human, mm, the human species, if you will. Is this kind of thing built into our DNA? I don't think so. I think it's it's when, well, you could say it's built into DNA, you can become stupid. And, uh, you know, when you read- That's what it, my wife says all the time, by the when, way. When, <laughs> I always taught, you know, I was teaching political philosophy in the poli sci department and talking about uh, Plato and Aristotle, you know, I always uh, emphasized that uh, both of them, especially Aristotle, but Plato, his teacher, uh, had no different ideas. People are inclined to not actualize what is really central to human nature, namely reason. And there are people, you know, who are slaves for that reason, slaves by nature. And, uh, you know, I would translate that word slave by nature into stupidity. And we have a lot of stupid people uh, in America today. I mean, look was, at this. Was that always the case, Manfred? Or, yes, it, or well, have something happened here? It to, has to... become worse. Yeah. I mean, look, when you think of the, when you think of this carnage, you know, that happened in Texas, uh, everybody is talking, 90% of Americans want gun control. But uh, some of these people must vote for politicians, not only, not only Trump, but local politicians who refuse um, to sp- sign on to any gun control uh, law. So uh, how do you explain that? How can you be on the one hand uh, for gun control, on the other hand, you vote people into office who are uh, really the opposite of what we need at this point. And yeah, I know I know how to get an answer on that. Huh? No, I don't either. Uh, no, I mean, no, Tim, Tim has the answer. Oh, no, Jay, I don't have the answer other than education, education, education. Right, but even though- uh, um, That is the answer. But I, I really think that um, cult figures use what I would call a direct propaganda, which if you really think about propaganda and how the tool on how it works, it's really a walking subliminal hypnosis. And human beings are certainly susceptible to hypnosis, uh, whether it's conscious or subliminal. And that's why subliminal advertising was outlawed in the 1960s because it was so effective. And uh, if you remember subliminal advertising was the flashing of images uh, at a, at a you know, very rapid speed that it would become subliminal <laughs> persuasion. So they outlawed it. Yeah. I don't Stephanie, you know, these works. guys are raising the prospect uh, that the media has a lot to do with this. What we get, you know, on TV and those graphic images Tim is talking about. Um, but can't, you know, can't we modify that? Um, is the First Amendment so absolute that we couldn't somehow withdraw the, you know, the stimulus um, to join a cult by changing the way the media works? Um. Interesting question. Uh, I, I like what Manfred said about the, the word stupid. My my uh, my take on that is the ignorance that we have right. until, as Tim said, the education brings us through to being able to operate at higher levels of thinking. Um, I think that until we move into uh, having all people access the ways that we analyze, the way we synthesize, the way we make judgments, the way we do critical thinking, the way we do that kind of uh, cognition. 
because my point about the teaching act is that it is rocket scientists because it is cognitive development and there's nothing harder than that including the rocket <laughs> yeah well you know manfred hitler knew uh, to teach the adolescents uh, the grade school kids in germany back in the early 30s he knew that if he brought them into his way of thinking they would be his later on and it worked it worked for him uh, the problem about education you know stephanie's idea is that it takes decades and generations to actually have an effect do we have the time uh, to fashion, uh, you know, a solution through education? Well, I don't know whether, you know, this uh, German illustration uh, works because after all, you know, uh, people have always pointed out this uh, extraordinary a contradiction between Germany being the society of culture, you know, in education, uh, they had the first graduate programs at universities and everybody copied the German university system, including the United States. Uh, science was uh, in charge, you know, uh, of, of all kinds of dimensions of German uh, life. And then you have this uh, incision in 1933. Uh, and I don't think education is uh, the only answer. It may not be the most important answer to cut through uh, to what may happen uh, in societies at certain points. I do not think that all, that all Trump voters in the United States are stupid. I mean, there are a lot of... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure as there were in Germany, you know, a lot of Nazis with PhDs in the SS, um, half of the, more than 50% of German lawyers were members of the NSDAP. Uh, so uh, you have, I mean, this, this cult definition that Tim gave, uh, I think it does not completely cover the political madness, you know, that uh, take, may take over societies. Uh, I mean, what is happening in, in the United States is not exceptional at this point. You have uh, these figures, you know, who are possessed by uh, megalomaniacal dreams about their societies. Uh, think of Erdogan's Ottoman vision, you know, think of Xi Jinping's uh, attempt, you know, to create a greater in China, including Taiwan. Uh, and Putin certainly is the best illustration of that. Now you have opposition in all of these societies, but for some strange reason, they are not able of breaking through. Um, well, if, I, if I give you a, if I give you a megalomaniac cult figure and, and I subtract him from the equation. Well, let, let me ask it first this way. If I don't subtract them from the equation, what's the dynamic? Do do cults get worse over time? Do the people who follow cults get more irrational, suicidal, and manipulatable over time, or does a cult sort of cool off after a while? What well, is in, Ger in the German us? case, you could say it's quite obvious. You know, it didn't only cool off; it simply died. Well, it as a result of a war. Yes, in 45. Now, all of the people that have been members of the cult suddenly told people uh, they weren't. I mean, they were lying. They went into denial. Uh, and that, I think, uh, becomes uh, very, very powerful when cults become uh, dominant. In a society, I mean, the, the the figures that Tim mentioned, like Jim Jones, for example, he, he was a, a an outsider, and the cult remained an outside phenomenon. It had not taken over American society, and many of these uh, cult figures uh, stayed that way. Whereas we are talking here about a phenomenon, you know, that uh, has uh, affected the entire society. Well, let me let me uh, flip my question on you. Suppose I, I take Trump or any of these other autocrat megalomaniacs out. In other words, you have a cult, 
And by definition, by Tim's definition, it's built around one um, very strong personality, uh, and and he is withdrawn. Uh, let's say one day he doesn't wake up, whatever it is. Um, does that, Manfred, is that the end of the cult? Is it, it the end be. of the phenomenon in a given society? It can be. I mean, I think, for example, it would be nice if someone would assassinate Putin. Uh, but I do not think there is anyone at this point in the inner circle of uh, his uh, government that will do that. Uh, I mean, the Russian generals are as cowardly as the German generals were who had the possibility to kill Hitler. And they were talking about that, you know, in the, in the movie uh, Munich, uh, you have these scenes uh, where German generals are talking about what they are going to do with Hitler, but no one did, even though they had, you know, the gun in their pocket and could have killed him. But I mean, after, uh, after 45, suddenly, you know, the cult was well, gone. Right away, we said never again. And part of never again, of course, that didn't stick, but never again meant we're not going to let this happen to us again. We're not going to be crazy, you know, irrational, suicidal. And, and, and yeah, but the never don't... again was not was not uh, said by Germans that were victims, you know, victim Jews were making uh, that argument. That was not a German line immediately after the war for 20 years. You know, you had denial. Well, well here's the question, though. Uh, if I take Trump out of the equation, Okay, and I have the society that he left behind, his his cult legacy. Uh, and this goes to the question I want to put to you, Tim. Um, is it going to come back like bad wine? Is does the society now bear the exposure, the vulnerability, the DNA likelihood uh, that another Trump will emerge? Uh, one of those uh, senators we love so much in right. in the Senate uh, will emerge and will take his place and satisfy the need, uh, play on the vulnerability of these people who have already learned uh, about stupidity. Um, so, so in the United States, if we take Trump out of the equation, uh, are we free of, of Trumpism? Are we free of the cult? No. I, I think we're, we're now in the realm of confusing the desire to be an autocrat versus a cult personality. Um, Governor Florida, Governor DeSantis is not a cult personality right. uh, like Trump, but he's going to take and pick up the ball where Trump left it, and he's going to run down the field with it, <clears throat> and he is going to try to erode democracy. Uh, you know, Trump has done great things to erode democracy, and that's why I go back to education. I mean, how do you preserve democracy if you don't know what it is? And that's why Civics 101 uh, is not being taught in high schools nearly to the degree it used to be. Tim, and how long that, does it take to train 50 million students about democracy? Uh, well, it, yeah, it may take uh, your point's well taken. Uh, I guess the question is, um, how long is, is a semester uh, or a quarter? Uh, take the class, learn what democracy is. And, um, you know, we can start there. It doesn't take generations. Uh, it takes generations to value what democracy is versus autocracy. But it doesn't take generations to understand what democracy is and what it takes to preserve it. And what it takes, most importantly, is to recognize when someone is trying to undermine it. Well, if you look at history and, you know, political science is really so close to history, um, you find that there have been cult figures. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Manfred, all through history uh, and in the human condition, they have emerged again and again and again. Am I right? Yeah, no, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. But I mean, look, when you're talking about the United States and what Tim said about education uh, is certainly correct. Uh, and now, you know, in the digital age, you know, it has become more and more difficult to compete, you know, with uh, the messages that are spread in, uh, the digital civil society, uh, but uh, the United States, you know, is unique in, in a way, celebrating violence 
by having the Second Amendment. I mean, it's the only society, the only civil, uh, civilized society where you have the right of citizens to defend themselves with arms. No other society has that. And this record of killings that you have, I mean, it's growing. You have 400 million guns in private hands. For God's sake, this is no, no other society uh, has suffers from this syndrome. And well, then, that, that goes to my ultimate question here. And then you have the other syndrome, and that's the, 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 the legacy of racism, especially uh, anti-Black racism. Uh, those are two features that uh, will not go away. Well, isn't part of cultism, this is, this is for your definition, Tim, isn't part of cultism, it's you have to follow me. And it's either you follow me or you don't follow me. You're my friend or you're my enemy. And so there's a hard dividing line. You know, and we have we certainly have divisiveness here in this country now. Uh, it's race, racist, it's uh, religious bigotry, you name it. Um, and, and that seems to be a dividing line between cult, the, the Trump cult and the others. It's part of the divisiveness. Is it not you're with me or you're against me? You know, Jay, I think it's always been with us. And it's, you know, and that, that definition is you're with them or against them. That's very true. But I think the things that uh, make a cult leader great is these things that have been under the surface. And uh, Trump brought it out. He was well, able to make it acceptable to be racist. He made it acceptable to be xenophobic. Thing. He that's made it acceptable for a lot of bad behavior. And now it's out above ground. It needs to be pushed back below the surface. I don't think we ever get rid of it. I just think we, we say as a society, uh, that's not acceptable and we don't want it out in the open air. Knock it off. Well, two things then. Uh, Stephanie, um, you know, it goes beyond just the media. Um, you know, both uh, Tim and Manfred have been talking about social media, electronic connection and so forth. If I'm a cult figure and I want to reach people, I want to reach their vulnerability, I want them to get on my team and off the other team and and be divisive, whatever it takes. Um, the media right now, the social media, the electronic mesh network that we have in this country and this world is a great aid to me. I mean, you know, technology, information technology has always been arguably the best weapon of, of, of a cultist. Um, uh, do you agree with that? And what would you do about it? Well, I think that we're overlooking another player in the World War world war game okay which is japan all right so and also there were samurai there for hundreds and hundreds of years all of whom were armed and all of whom exerted force but we also have more importantly the cultural context and i know it was a nasty kind of thing for hillary clinton to say but she mentioned the deplorables so there people are in different bubbles and cultures and are influenced by different kinds of things and so in bringing them out of ignorance and into literacy and then into cognitive activity that's at the higher level you know the, all of those influences and pressures are are there for these people to have to cope with so um you know there 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 are a few ways to influence people humans i mean that you can question them you can lecture them you can you can model for them you can try to you know get do something about their thinking with contingency management you can give them feedback and these are things that all of these leaders have done because they know the human well and what it is it that it takes to influence them and one and uh, one one of them i think doesn't seem to be direct hits and forces like for instance in the david koresh situation mm -hmm. so i think yes we can do it in a generation bring people uh if we could if we could do a decent education system okay and and, and like in germany no we're not we're not working with um the violin prodigies and the piano players and the, the great talents that you know 50 percent of the population is there okay and who are these people that hillary talked about in the, some of those last comments there's a there's a portion of our population that is needy and and has and and wants to maintain this presence that they have under these leaders and that is satisfied with trump and I think that in answer to some of your questions is that, you know, if Trump goes away, that that is that is a problem for them. They won't have that any longer. And uh, 
there's a chance to do something about it. But I mean, it's probably a little bit open. Man Manfred, back to war. You know, you guys have been you know talking at least peripherally about violence, and I suggest to you that violence, uh, especially wholesale violence, widespread violence, uh, tends to um, you know make a reality test. It tends to show people that really have to think it through um, before they become irrational. They've got to shed the chains of irrationality, so to speak. Uh, and I and I suggest to you that cults uh, have often in history and political science ended with violence. And violence is a kind of the cure in a terrible way. Um, is that still the case? Uh, will the end of cultism by Trump or his successors um, will it wind up in violence and will the violence correct it? Well, it's, I'm, look, we talked about it before and I think, uh, you know, the U.S. finds itself today in a very peculiar situation that I sometimes uh, compare with the last years of the Weimar Republic. Uh, now, Trump is not Hitler, uh, but the situation that you have in the United States, uh, in some say, is bordering on civil war. Uh, I am not uh, completely uh, convinced that it will come to that. But you have, in addition to the cult dimension that we were talking about, you have this really uh, strange phenomenon of the institutional uh, permission, you know, uh, to become violent by owning guns. I mean, I mentioned that before, the, this is exceptional. America is really exceptional in this very negative sense that you have the institutionalized permission through the Second Amendment. I mean, the Second Amendment was not meant for, for that. The militia dimension had to do with Washington didn't want to have a standing army because the standing army of the, the British Empire uh, was uh, a very bad uh, memory for the founders. But then this Second Amendment took on a life of its own. Uh, and what uh, you could really see, say is what you have here is the the institutionalization of the permission to be violent. That's exceptional. No other society has that permission. Oh, Manfred, man, suppose, suppose I withdraw that. I subtract it uh, from the, the American formula. That would be I, nice, but you can I, I, I know it's hard. I'm going to ask Tim about how you do that. <laughs> I leave these questions for him. <laughs> but let's assume it can be done, like in Australia. Let's assume it can be done. Or New Zealand. Does that, does that, yes. Does that solve the problem if I withdraw the Second Amendment? Some, some issues would vanish, yes. Does it withdraw the problem of cultism? No. So what's the connection uh, then? Does, does cultism require guns? Does it require the Second Amendment? And does the Second Amendment naturally create cultism? No, I think the American situation is unique in, in that respect. Uh, cultism, I mean, the possibility of uh, cultish figures uh, becoming hegemonic in a society is a universal possibility. Uh, but in the American case, the Second Amendment adds the institutional permission to violence that is really exceptional. So is there a a natural sign curve on this where you have cultism, you have irrationality, you have, you know, gross, widespread stupidity, and then over time, something, something inherent in the human condition emerges and, and shows people that's not a good way to live, shows people they have to, they have to, you know, shed the chains of cultism. Well, you could say Germany, post-war Germany is a good illustration of uh, some, something like that can happen. It took two decades until really in the, in the beginning, in the late 1960s, when Willy Brandt became chancellor, and then in the 70s and 80s, so that uh, Germany became the pacifist society uh, and became, in a way, immunized. Today, you know, the radical right in Germany is down to 5%. In the the last state elections, uh, so what you have there is an immunization. Now, whether it's education, experience, or whatever it may be, 
uh, it's a good illustration. Germany is a very, in that sense, a very good illustration of how societies can come out of this uh, heritage, you know, uh, overcome it, come to terms with it. Yeah. And you, you know how difficult it was for the present German government, you know, to support uh, this warlike uh, reaction to Putin's invasion of uh, the, the Ukraine. And it's the Greens of all people in Germany who have pushed uh, the government in, in that direction. That's the, really interesting the way that works. Yes. So, Tim, so Tim suppose, suppose I'm a Chinese citizen uh, living in Shanghai, and I wake up one morning and say, um, I'd really like to have an assault rifle. Uh, an AR-15 would be fine. Like, I'll, I'll keep it in my in my dresser drawer. Nobody will know about it. I'm going to go down to the gun shop at the corner, and I'm going to see if I can't buy an AR-15. What happens to me? Well, in China, you're you're going to be to a re-education camp uh, because no one would dream owning a weapon uh, based on communism and the the need to keep the regime in power. Uh, right. A gun represents the ability to change a regime. And so, uh, you know, to use that example, though, I get a gun and I keep it in the closet. And no one knows I have it. Uh, that's 70 percent of all gun owners in America. Uh, there is 400 million guns. And I guarantee you, 400 are not registered. 400 million are not registered. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to get to a the, the, the point I want to make, though, is that China is an autocracy or, yeah. or, you know, depending exactly how you define it. But. It's an autocracy, and so the ownership of guns in China don't don't lead to autocracy. They can coexist. You can have no guns, and you can have autocracy. Yes, um, you know Putin. Putin's greatest scare is an uprising. He saw what happened to uh, Libya, Mo, uh, Gaddafi, and you know killed in a sewage pipe. That scared him deeply. And uh, when Russia started having these uh, open protests in the street. I mean, he was really very rattled and shaken by that. Now, imagine Putin having to deal with people who had guns that came out in the streets. Um, that's why autocrats don't like weapons uh, being owned by, by private citizens. They don't but like he, it at all because they can be used but, against them. But Trump but the, does. The, 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 uh, the, Manfred? The Ukraine is the, the best illustration for what Tim just said, because that's what Putin saw, you know, the, the revolutionary moves that you had there in 2014 scared uh, the hell out of him. And remember, the dramatizing experience for him was in Dresden, October 1989, you know, when he was a KGB officer in Dresden in East Germany. And uh, the, there were East German uh, protesters who wanted to storm the building. And, uh, you know, he was frantically burning all kinds of documents uh, in the building. And then he went out and talked to them. Now, he had this advantage of putting, <laughs> uh, he had the advantages of having learned German while he was there. And so he spoke in German to them and he convinced them. I mean, he was a very persuasive guy. He convinced them to not enter the building. But nevertheless, that October experience, people say, uh -huh traumatized Putin and the Ukraine is the very best illustration, you know, for what it did to his soul, if he has any. I mean, Bush thought he saw his soul, but he may, may not have any anyway. But uh, the Ukraine, he, the Ukraine scared him because he thought the Ukraine would become the model for what would happen to civil society in Russia. Well, it still may happen just that way. Yes, um, I, I, I wish about... for that or pray for that. Um, yes. uh, Stephanie, we're almost out of time, but I, I, I did want to ask you, you know, is there, what is the connection between guns and autocracy? Um, that we, we have guns and we have Trump, a cult figure, yeah. um, you know, who would be an autocrat if he possibly could, who is heading in that direction. And yeah. so it's not clear that we can, you know, ever, you know, withdraw guns from the American formula. But can they coexist here? Uh, well, it's, they, a, it's a deadly brew, is it not? Well, they are. But what's coming out from the Jan 6 committee is that many people did not bring their guns to Washington, D.C. that day because, like Hawaii, Washington has very strict gun laws, always has. And so as a result, 
it could have been uh, many people were there without their weapons and they're admitting it now and just because of that so as as a result of that finding now there's a movement to change the law in washington dc to permit gun carrying and uh uh all the, the versions of of guns that they want to have available to people who are going to come into that city okay so well I, we're, we're just about know. out of time so i i want to go around the table of um manfred your last comments about this i mean i suppose the, the central question here is is does the cult figure need guns? How does the cult figure play with guns? Uh, can we you know, subtract guns from the equation and, and still have a cult? Can we subtract a cult and still have guns? Yes, I think you can. After all, I mean, Hitler came to power. He was not elected. He was appointed by the senile president Hindenburg in, on the 30th of January, 1933. And I mean, you had guns uh, against the Nazis, you know, the street fights in Berlin between communists and Nazis were uh, really extraordinary. But uh, I do not think uh, he was, he came to power as a result of uh, his armed uh, followers, uh, you know, making that possible. So you can have a cult figure coming to power without guns. Okay, let's, let's go to Tim uh, for, uh, you know, a wind up here. Uh, Tim, I've, I've said before, and I wonder what your thoughts are and your final comments are, is that <clears throat> this guy who shut up the uh, the, the school, um, was it yesterday, day before, whatever? The day before, yes, day before, before yesterday. Uh, years old. You, you know, they say he was acting on his own account. Okay, that's what they say. But was he really? He was, he was acting for a public uh, that he sought to impress with his social media and his streaming video. He was acting for a community that he perceived was out there. Uh, and I suggest to you, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, that he was not really alone. He was the point of a spear. He was the point of a, of a, of a violent community who believes in guns and, and, um, you know, and, and a sort of violence on a, on a stage, on a stage of, uh, what do you want to call it, fatal legacy. Uh, your thoughts about that, your thoughts about this discussion? Couldn't agree with you more, Jay. Um, I'm thinking of all the testimony of those who were arrested and charged in the January 6th insurrection of our capital. And if you remember, most of them said, I was invited. I was invited by Donald Trump. And they used Donald Trump as their motivation to do bad things to our capital and bad things to the Capitol Police. So yes, um, it goes to this. A cult leader really is the center of gravity of evil. And as we know, evil begets evil. And Donald Trump, with a, you know, through his words and through his actions, his boorish behavior, his implementation of policy that was wor worst at best, um, he said it's okay to, to lack civility in a society. He said it's okay to act badly and, and do badly and behave, and behave badly in society. He gave the green light. And for that 33% of Americans, or even in the world, there's always about a third of people who will gravitate towards that. It takes the forces of, of civility and, and, and the powers of good to say, no, you're not gonna rise to the top. You're not gonna win the day in our society. Go back underground under that rock which you belong. And that's where we're at is the forces have to push this, I call it evil, uh, back under the rock. But right now it's loose. And, and, and we have a lot of things that have caused that to happen, uh, specifically social media and, and 24 hour news service, giving us a green light to act badly. Mm, there'll be more. Uh, I hope you'll all come back. I mean, Manfred, I hope you'll come back and we'll talk some more about this because it's, uh, you know, it's under the hood. And, and I'm left with one thought I want to mention really quickly. Uh, one of the great cult figures in American history was Huey Long in Louisiana. And if you recall how his career as a cult figure ended up, he was shot dead. That's how it ended up. And then that cult stopped only to be followed by others. Thank you very much, Manfred Henningsen, uh, Tim Apicella, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Thank you very much for this important and provocative discussion. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.